Okay, so hi everybody. My name is Alan. I come from the University of Lausanne. And this paper is a joint work with uh, IGC, um, Marguerite de Ponchel, who is here, uh, Meli Jo from the World Bank, uh, Olivier Cadot, my actual thesis director, and Nicola Berman from the Graduate Institute. And we're making an analysis on how exporters adjust to exchange rate fluctuations. So we have some new evidence from the East African community. So the main idea is what are the key policy issues in East Africa, Eastern African community? So we have two sides. One is the trade integration one, in which you have custom unions, some attempts to cooperate in building a common market though. We have also some reductions in, in NTBs, some mutual recognition agreements in some services, for example. And on the other hand, we have monetary integration, which is basically, we're, we're trying to look for arguments to see whether we have it's, it's ideal to have a monetary union or not. So our strategy will be to, to infer how exporters adapt to exchange rate fluctuations, which is a, a whole literature on what is called exchange rate pass-through. I will come back to that afterwards. And after that, we'll go, we're going to see also a little bit of what is the real cost of exchange volatility on trade. So our strategy basically will be to, to infer the, the, the extent of market power, so the lack of market integration in the ESC with this strategy. So the first question to, to answer is whether these monetary unions are, are good or not. So we have some monetary unions, like, with, like fixed exchange rate codes, that are vulnerable to asymmetric shocks. We have lack of market integration that raises the probability of asymmetric shocks. So market integration and monetary integration are strictly linked. We also have, for instance, uh, as an example, the all expectation in some EAC members, for example, in Uganda, which is raising a lot. But that, that will be a major asymmetric shock. And so far, there is no actual evidence that, it's, that there's more growth within a monetary union, with a monetary union than in other custom, uh, like custom unions. So the, ba the basic thing is that we know that exchange policy is key to export growth. We have this example from a paper from Fren and Perola, who show that uh, surges are preceded by a large depreciation of the real exchange rate and lower exchange rate volatility. It actually just allowed the, the exporters to be more competitive. And on the other hand, there's a, there's a very huge um, result in the literature, which is on, the, on the, what is called the exchange rate disconnect, is that we don't have any evidence of prices in the consuming countries to, to um, react to any macroeconomic variables. And as export and um, exchange rate is important, we also have that there's a very important issue on small manufacturers, which is kind of the, the main idea we're looking for here in this paper. So we know that, for example, in the East African community, it's extremely concentrated. For example, close to 60% of EAC exporters realize over 95% of their export turnover on regional markets. But at the same time, these are the smaller countries, the, the smaller firms. So you can see, for example, here in figure three, the share of regional sales in export across export turnover distribution. It's, you see the, the, um, the link between the two. So what we're gonna do, first I'm gonna explain quickly what it's been done in, on the literature before. So the first thing is to, what they do is that they have the price in the consumer country, this is LNPC on the upper hand, and they, they, they look for the, for the effect of, this, of the exchange rate in the consumer country, which is, is called ERPT, the exchange rate pass-through. But what we're gonna do is that we're gonna look on the other side, which is the, which is the, the producing country side. So we're gonna estimate this uh, beta P, which is the, the reaction of the, the, the real exchange rate fluctuation on the unit prices of the, in, the, in the producing countries. So for making it clear, what we're gonna try to infer is that as we have this price into market, this is a proof of imperfect competition in the countries. So just to make it clear, if you have some incomplete pass-through, which is basically that the, the price is not changing within the, the real exchange rate, we're gonna have a, a proof that is actual imperfect competition. So we have some literature. Um, the first one is on Princeton that shows that, for example, if, uh, if the exchange rate doubles, say for, I don't know, 0.7 euros per dollar to 1.4, we have the U.S. consumer price that goes down only by 30%. That's the, and it's a very common uh, result. We have some results from Marston, for example, 
where, where the price into market is extremely, it's 0 0.5, 0 0.9. And, and it's, it's also variable across sectors. So the basic thing is that we have incomplete exchange, exchange rate pass through. So we have price into market. And, and this is taking an evidence of variable markups, which means basically imperfect competition and market segmentation, market segmentation and so on. So on the other hand, these were country level estimates. From the, from, on the other hand, with all these new customs data that we have on, the, on, the developing country, on developed countries, we have some firm level estimates that show roughly around 0.1% of, 0.9% of price into market. And we have some examples, for example, Berman et al, who did it for France, Fossey, who, do it, who did it for Denmark, and Chatterjee et al, who did it for, um, for Brazil. So we have more price into market for large firms. These are the basic results. More price into market for core products, and more price into market for more productive firms. So the, the basic, uh, Comparative statistics we're going to analyze is that basic standard models of trade, uh, trade standard models, as in Berman and Chatterjee. So we have on the one side, we have prices. We have more productive firms that, pri that price more to market. We have also more pricing to market in destinations with higher distribution costs. We have less pricing to market in faraway destinations. And we have less pricing to market in destinations where competition is tougher. I'm going to explain a little bit more afterward. Then we have volumes. Uh, we have more productive firms that have lower volume elasticity. We have lower volume elasticity in destinations with higher distribution costs, higher volume elasticity for faraway destinations, and higher volume elasticity in destinations where competition is tougher too. So here is some basic notation. We have uh, bilateral distance, which is taken as a proxy of credit costs. We have also destination GDP approximation, approximating the, the competition. We have the number of products, which is approximation the, the, the firm productivity. We have um, a dummy variable that, that, that says whether uh, a good is manufactured or not. And we control by fixed effects within our, for origin year, for firm product destination, and of course, the main variable, which is the real exchange rate. So, and our dependent variable, which is the unit price from a, of a firm, from a, of a product P, from a, to a destination in a particular time. So this is our baseline estimation. We have a, a, the log of the unit price, and then we have also all the regressors, and we're gonna focus on this pricing to market coefficient, which is this alpha, which is the beta we were talking about before. So we have some estimation issues, exchange rate exogenous to pricing. That's, I mean, we don't have any endogeneity bias there, but and that's maybe the difference between our paper and the ones from the developed countries in which you have uh, other data sets from service that allows to have some more information on the firms. Here we only have the customs, the, the customs, the customs information, but it's, it's um, I mean, the good thing is that we have multi 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 multiple countries, they only had one country, so that's basically what we're gonna do. So we proxy the, for example, the, with the lag number of products, but it's not terribly powerful. And we also define the number of products at firm level and not a um, non-firm product definition, but it's also, it's not very strong though. And this is our data set, so it's very rich. We have six different countries, Bangladesh, Kenya, Morocco, Tanzania, and Uganda, Uganda and Rwanda. The good thing is that we have a very large sample. As you can see, we have almost more than one million observations. The bad is that no, no, we, don't, we don't have any uh, firm level covariate except from, except from the ones constructed from our database. And the, the ugly, we have very, very noisy data. We have a lot of mistakes, many errors in the measures for the volumes, for the prices, and, but we have to, we, we clean the, the data sets, eliminate outliers and stuff like that. So these are the baseline results. So this is for the whole sample. And what we're gonna focus on is that, so we have the same, we have the same, yeah. We have basically the same, the same results as in the previous literature with 0 0.1 in the, without any regressors. And we also, I mean, we, we, we try to um, redo what the literature has done 
So for example, regarding the, some, of the, some of the interaction terms between the real exchange rate and some contravaluables, we have the, expect, the, expected, the expected results. And the most important thing is that we find this little result with a dummy that it's for, the, for trade between the, within the Eastern African community, which is a dummy whether it's a bilateral trade or not within the, within, the, within the East African community. And we find that there is more pricing to market in the Eastern African community, which means basically that there is a, a proof that there's imperfect competition within the market. Here we, I present the, the results of the volume elasticities. They are a little bit more complicated to interpret because, for instance, these coefficients, when you get the holder regressors, shouldn't be that big. This implies very large elasticity of substitutions. But, I mean, we, 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 we basically focus on the, on the part of the, on the prices. So here we're going to see only for the EXE exporters and we see a result in which we have non-pricing to market for, for when we include all the regressors, but for the particular EAC bilateral trade, we do find more pricing to market, which is a proof, again, that we have imperfect competition within the, within the Eastern African community. So summing up the results, so we have a pricing to market coefficient around 0 0.1 without all the interaction terms. Um, we have the volume elasticities that are not very easy to interpret because they imply very large elasticities of substitution. We have, and for the EAC, export, EAC exporters, which is our main focus, is that in general we don't have pricing to market, so, we, so this implies that there's no market power. But at the same time, when we take only the EAC, EAC, EAC sample, we had very strong pricing to market. So this is suggesting substantial market power. Now, besides the pricing to market analysis that we do, we also make some, some analysis on the effects of volatility, of exchange rate volatility on the, on the entry and exits of the firms. And basically we found that it doesn't matter that much whether we have higher volatility or less for exports, which is kind of counterintuitive, but it's what we found. So basically for summing up, the conclusions, we have pricing to market behavior of exporters suggests strong evidence of market power in the, in the EAC markets. So the markets are still segmented. We have a lot of um, tariffs. And it's difficult to arbitrage between this infant industry protection and need to discipline abuses of market power. On the other hand, in the entry exit analysis, we have, we have uh, results that don't provide any strong evidence that it's actually important to have a, customs, uh, a monetary union. We have exit rates that go down with exchange rate rate volatility. We have exit rates not higher for credit constrained firms. Maybe I didn't explain that. We have this financial dependence measure, which basically says if a firm depends a lot on credit or not. And we don't have any strong evidence on that. So the policy's implications is that we have to focus on Persian regional trade integration because we have a lot of market power within the EAC. And we're still looking for compelling cases of of, of a launch process to, to monetary integration. So that's the, thank you very much. <laughs>